or something. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone found some coffee somewhere. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if we have to pay a dollar now or not, or we can just t take it. But uh, but anyway, uh, Tony, I want to thank you guys for putting it on a, on a great form. It's been great. Uh, yeah, let's pick up. Is better? Yeah. Okay. The uh, Anyway, we're fortunate and blessed uh, to have our next speaker. Uh, Kelly Poole uh, is a senior project manager at the Environmental Council of States. She works with the Ecos Air Committee and the E-Enterprise for the Environmental Initiative. Prior to that, she got her uh, uh, law degree at the, tennis, at the uh, School of Tennessee and uh, was the coordinator, uh, let me get the right school, not Tennessee. She worked in Tennessee, she got her law degree from the Natural Resources from Indiana University, Robert McKinney School of Law, and has a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish from the University of Tennessee. We were comparing notes on law, law degrees since I have two daughters that are, have, are attorneys. And, uh, but anyway, she's been a fantastic resource at ECOS. I know she's worked with our state, with my executive director, with our Secretary of Energy and Environment on uh, initiatives with the Enterprise. Uh, her uh, side notes, the, the law school that she went to, Vice, Vice President Pence graduated from the same law school she went to, and uh, she's a native in, of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, she's been married to her husband, Brian, and he works at EPA for now 10 years, right? And he works in Superfund. So uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly. Kelly? And I did not go to school with Pence, unfortunately. He, he graduated a little earlier than I did. But, um, <laughs> so um, so um, my name is Kelly, and I work for the Environmental Council of the States. And we're a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that brings the heads of state environmental departments together. So the directors, the commissioners, they're the members of our organization. Um, and we work with them to help them cooperate share ideas, leverage resources. A lot of times when a state's thinking about doing something, they, talk, they like to talk to their peers. Odds are somebody's already done it and they can share ideas and send over notes and um, nope, they don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. We do sometimes um, articulate the state position when appropriate, although sometimes when you have states like California and Texas, Connecticut and West Virginia all in the same room, it doesn't always, um, um, and they do a really good job of focusing on what drives them together, and there is a lot that drives them together. Um, and so that tends to be what we what we um, talk about, um, at least publicly. So, and I was I did a presentation a while ago, and I forgot to advance the slides. And like the very, I had the slide. I was looking at them on my notes, and then I realized that it had been that slide like forever, and nobody said anything, and it was very nice of them. But, <laughs> but yeah, somebody else. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so Enterprise to the Environment, it is um, modernizing the business of environmental protection and through the model of shared governance, states, tribes, and EPA have been working um, to uh, modernize how they implement the environmental programs. Um, and they really um, put into practice the tenets of cooperative federalism. And they've been, they've been working together since about 1998, so they've been doing it for a while actually. Um, and through this shared governance, they kind of lead together and they work together to improve um, environmental outcomes um, and to lower costs and you know, reduce burden on everyone. And you know, this is for the benefit of the public, um, regulated entities and agencies, federal and state. So it kind of is a win, win, win for everyone in the end. Um, it's easier to manage and easier to um, input data in a lot of cases, resets the goal, and then you also have um, better data available to agencies and the public. Um, and they accomplish a lot of this um, through streamlining processes and optimizing technology. Um, so those are two of the really main um, points that these e-enterprise projects really focus on. Um, so streamlining processes, they like, they lean culture, they look at business process improvements. You know, a lot of these environmental laws have been around for a while. EPA is all, um, a little over 45 years old and some state agencies are actually even older than, than um, EPA. So they've been doing this for a while. A lot of these programs grew up pre-technology and they also grew up kind of 
siloed in some cases in different programs in different areas. Um, so taking a second look at everything that's going on, they sometimes just want to modernize and lean the process within their own agency. And then sometimes they look at combining different programs that have similar um, data needs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one program called the Combined Air Emission Reporting Initiative that's looking at combining multiple um, air emissions reporting programs. They all require the same data in some cases um, and trying to, to combine those so that industry isn't having to like enter same or almost the same data, you know, varies by decimal points sometimes, multiple times, four or five times depending on um, how many programs there are. Now, um, this shared governance model started in 1998 with the Environmental Information Exchange Network, um, which still exists, but E-Enterprise did kind of grow out of that network. Um, in 1990, I believe is when the internet as we know it started to kind of take shape. And so in 1998, a group of EPA states, territories, got together and um, created a mechanism to securely share data. Um, and they've been kind of uh, managing it in a collaborative way ever since. So, and it's explained to me like it's the pipes, so states and EPA can send data back and forth to each other. Um, and as e-enterprise grew, um, the e-enterprise environment initiative involves more than just technology. So they've actually moved the exchange network into the enterprise that's not kind of under the enterprise and governed by the same governing bodies that work with the enterprise. Um, the exchange network does still focus on technology and shared services. So they look at you know, standardizing data exchanges to make it easier. Um, and then collaboration and they have a meeting coming up and uh, the enterprise national meeting in October and they will showcase a lot of the enterprise projects and they also um, tend to focus on the technology aspect and looking for technological solutions that can be shared. So sometimes specific teams that are working under e-enterprise come up with a novel solution or they work with a contractor to come up with some sort of like program or interface and they try to do it in a way where they can share it with um, other teams and other EPA offices. So the leadership of e-enterprise, um, they have, there's three main co-chairs that head up the enterprise leadership council, which is the main governing body. And right now it's Henry Darwin is the EPA representative, Becky Keogh of Arkansas, DEQ is the state representative, and Nico and Marthal is the tribal representative. And um, they deal with a lot of the high level issues. Um, it's made up of political and career staff. There's, there's, um, there's like 15 or so people actually on the whole EELC. Um, they set the strategic direction, look at policy issues, and try to make sure all stakeholder perspectives are included. Um, and then there's the enterprise management board, um, which handles more of the day-to-day -day issues, strategy and policy, and elevates things to the ELC. And then there's the interoperability and operations team, which is on the EPA side is co-chaired by the Office of Environmental Information. So they do look more at the tech side of things and kind of support um, innovation um, with tech and through some of the EPA offices and then also through contractors. So the characteristics of an enterprise team, they, um, like I said before, really work to streamline and modernize um, the business of uh, business processes. They um, usually have, or they always have um, at least two co-chairs. So a, an EPA representative and a state representative. Um, and that's kind of in the model, the shared governance and cooperative federalism. Uh, and the teams are diverse. They're made up of states and EPA mostly. Then we do have, on the air side, we do have um, locals that join the teams and then tribal um, representatives also join um, um, all the teams as well. And um, they, we tend to try to make sure they're diverse. So we've got politically, political diversity and geographic diversity. Um, it doesn't always work out perfectly just because you know people are busy and a lot of these projects are in addition to their jobs, but we try to do a really good job of keeping um, everyone informed and giving people opportunities to call in to a, a big group call that you don't have to be a team member to get the update um, or give people an opportunity to uh, talk to their state colleagues and kind of give their input on a one-off basis um, if it's needed. So they don't have to 
dedicate time to the team if they don't have it. Um, and they streamline and modernize the work. They look at what's working, what's not working. One example is um, with state implementation plans, they just modernize the system for actually um, pushing those plans from the state to EPA. And they spent about a year working with, I think about 14 different states, um, just volunteers who wanted to go through the current process and talk about what they were doing, what they, what was on their wish list, what they didn't, what attributes they didn't use, what was hard. And then they worked with a contractor to kind of vote and ID their highest priorities. And then once the contractor built an interface, the states beta tested it for a month or so. And um, <clears throat> they've been using it. It's been live since January. And it's a voluntary system where 48 states have signed up to use it. And they've submitted 40 different documents on it so far, just since the middle of January. So it'd be draft SIPs and SIPs. Um, and then it also streamlines, you know, right now the states are using it and they're gonna circle back in the summer and kind of talk about, is there anything else we need to look at and change? And EPA is also using this system internally to help streamline their processing of SIPs, which um, I don't know if you guys are aware of the state implementation plan backlog, but it got pretty, big at one point, so they're trying to avoid that. Um, and then that goes to also the buy-in. Um, by getting everyone involved early on, the states, locals, tribes, anybody who wants to volunteer and be involved and share their input, um, it does kind of, you get better products in the end versus where EPA maybe in the past would have modernized the system or worked with a contractor to create some sort of database or online portal and then said, hey, we've got this new thing, it's you're gonna love it. And then the states were like, yeah, but that, it doesn't really do this or that or, um, so instead, they decided, you know, it would with, with, save resources if we just talk to everybody on the front end and actually like, you know, and sometimes states, you know, they're in contact with, they know the on the ground enforcement and, and implementation of programs and they talk to industry every day and they, you know, they bring all that to the table. So, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the teams. This is the Combined Air Emissions Reporting Team, we call it CARE. Um, Mark Huyu and OAQPS and Brian Shaw, the chairman of T Texas TCEQ, um, are the co-chairs. So and they're look this team is looking to combine the National Emissions Inventory, the NEI, the Toxic Release Inventory, TRI, GHG, the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory, and the CEDRI. Um, reporting system that's compliance and emission data reporting interface, um, which I had to write down because I don't always remember that one. Um, but they're looking at combining those because a lot of them do ask for similar information. And so it's, and they're looking at everything from, sometimes it's the same, that they're wanting the same answer, but they, one program requires you to do it to two decimal points, points the other one requires you to do it to like zero decimal points. And so when you actually try to combine them, they'll, you know, the computer will tell you there's no match, but um, so they're looking at that. They're creating, um, working to create emissions factor compendiums. They're trying to um, look at, kind of synchronize all, all the emissions factors and SEC codes and things that everybody uses, clean these systems up so that um, eventually they can be used as the um, information that feeds into a common emissions form um, so that industry could log into one place and, the dream is they would log into one place and it would only ask them based on their facility ID for the information they needed to put in. There wouldn't be any extra questions. Um, and then that would send, um, then it would send the information at the appropriate time to the appropriate program. So, and this is something that the states actually um, pushed back on a little bit early on. EPA kind of had this idea that maybe it would just flow to everyone at the same time, like you enter the answer and everybody gets it. And um, states really wanted to preserve the, the quality assurance checks that they get to do over you know six months or nine months. Um, so they can build that in the business role so that it'll put the data in, but it won't push out to EPA until a certain date or until somebody at the state level checks off on it. Um, so, and that's one of those examples where I think if EPA had kind of done this in a closed space, they probably would have said, oh, it just, it's just gonna flow to everybody, why not? Um, and then you would have had states and industry probably not using it because they, would, they don't want it to flow right away. They wanna be able to kind of talk and make sure there aren't mistakes. Um, let's see. And this is one of the first teams that's actually using an agile development process. So they're, used, they're doing like teams that are in six month sprints 
and sometimes stays joined for one six month sprint, sometimes stays stay on um, longer and kind of working on little pieces of the puzzle, um, trying to start with projects that are short term wins, like cleaning up SCC codes where like that's helpful right now, but it's also essential to the end product. Um, and so trying to kind of go little steps at a time and instead of putting out the whole plan, building this huge thing and then hoping it worked. I think the classic example of that is the um, Obamacare website that crashed because they that's how government used to do things. They didn't do tiny little piece, pieces of it and test it. Um, <clears throat> and this is just an example of kind of what their the care team is thinking with industry and then kind of logging into one place and then filling out the common emissions form and it being pushed to different systems. Um, and to make this possible, you would need um, one facility identification code, not multiple, um, which I think is maybe one of the biggest challenges. Um, there's a whole team working on it uh, with four <laughs> leaders. So from Wyoming, Oklahoma, and then OAQPS and OEI, um, looking at how to synchronize all these facility identification codes. Um, so they're starting with AIR because the CARE project is kind of a big one and it's kind of, and it's moving, it's moving along well. So they're starting with the AIR programs, they're gonna try to synchronize those. Um, so the facility or the stack or whatever would have one identification that it would log into. And you know they've gotta look at things as simple as like how, uh, the address is defined like for some program it's the it's the mailing address for others it's actual location for others it's the gate where the facility where you enter the facility so that has to be synchronized among a lot of other things um, and then this i was talking about a little earlier the state pl plan electronic collection system um specs and they call it specs for sips because it replaced the e-sips um, interface. So I think ESIPS, the way it was explained to me, was on the intranet, so it wasn't actually on the internet. Um, and some states were using SharePoint to send their SIPs. Um, so this actually, um, they can submit drafts, they can submit SIPs through this system, and um, EPA can see it, and different offices can work on it simultaneously. There's a dashboard, and you can see where the SIP is in the process all the time and who has it. Um, and you can, I think you can upload really large documents, which was one of their problems in the beginning. It's so pretty big. And on each of these slides, I've got contact information for um, some of the main people who could answer questions. And you can also always email me too, and I can connect, if I can't answer the question, I can connect you with who can. Um, and then, let's see. And with the specs for SIPs, they also would like to expand that interface to permitting as well, which might affect industries more directly. Um, so that's the hope to streamline permitting through that system. So in the advanced monitoring team, this one's a little bit in flux. It's gonna be moving out of OECA, so it won't be under David Hendon in OECA um, in probably the next couple of weeks and try to find a new home somewhere um, in EPA. Right now, OAQPS is kind of the main, and OARD, I believe, are working. Um, on a big conference in June. Um, and then this is how, basically looking at how to leverage all the new technology that's coming onto the market pretty rapidly. Um, and it's more economical. That's an, that's an example of just a personal personal sensor that the public might buy. But they're, they're looking at, um, I think, mostly sensors that are cheap, like two grand, I think, the, the cheaper sensors. Um, that maybe, that wouldn't be federally verified, wouldn't necessarily meet that standard, but is there a way that they can um, test them and verify them in a faster manner so that maybe they can start to be used in different aspects, not for um, like statutory reporting requirements, but um, to kind of help inform decisions and maybe help inform modeling if, if they can deploy more, if they know it's a good sensor and they can deploy more sensors in an area, then you might get better data. Um, in Oklahoma, one person had an example of a water sensor that they, they bought a kind of a less expensive water sensor, and when there was a spill or a discharge, they would take that out and use it to actually find, pinpoint the area where they were pretty sure the discharge came from, and then they would bring out the federally verified monitor and get their data that way. So, um, and apparently that, that saved them money or was easier to, it made it easier for them to, um, instead of bringing the 
the more expensive sensor out and using it multiple times to bring the cheaper one out. Um, so yeah, and that team, that team is also looking at data standards, like is there a way we can standardize the market um, or help encourage the market to, to standardize and what information do sensors need to collect in general? Um, and then also data interpretation, working on ways to communicate to the public maybe what the difference in some of these cheaper sensors are and then the federally verified sensors and there's some in between. Um, they do kind of, state agencies are kind of seeing a little more uptick in I think some of the questions about, you know, I have this personal air monitor, I have this app on my phone, and what does it mean? And also communicating, like a lot of these real-time sensors versus the eight-hour ozone standard that they're, they're reading on, they're looking at online on EPA's website, and kind of communicating those differences and what that means, so. Um, and, and yeah, this is, they have a workshop coming up in June. Um, I believe the in-person seats are filled, and it's in Raleigh, North Carolina. RTP and but there's still our webinar slots and they're going to be looking at um, performance targets for sensors so not like look, they're looking at PM 2.5 and ozone and what are some what are they're looking at international what um, other countries have done and what academics have done different papers people have written and um, what are some good ideal best practices for a manufacturer who's making these sensors to kind of aim for um, so they're not going to like make a determination. They're just going to you know, put it out there and collect the information, I guess, and write it up. Um, and then this is the e-enterprise e portal. And I know a little bit less about this than some of the other ones. So I don't staff this one specifically. But this one is mentioned specifically in this EPA strategic plan, along with a few other um, e enterprise comments that have to do with the kind of shared governance model. Um, and this is going to be a, or it is live right now. And there's a link in the slide if you guys get them and watch the video. But it's a web platform to modernize environmental tra transactions. So something like the Care Portal, where you have multiple, you know, where an industry would go to enter their data, would maybe live on this this website, and the industry would sign in, and they would kind of see all of their reporting requirements would be all in one place um, and it would go it would go across programs so everything from air water date specific issues um, would all be in one spot uh, so and you can test it out right now it is live and they I know they do have some um, lead certification things up online that um, make it easier for I think it's people remove lead based paint but it's a, it's a start so um, but yeah, they hope to add some things. They hope to put the specs for SIPs, the spec system on there where the SIPs come in. Um, they're thinking about maybe adding that to this portal. Um, so that's where it would kind of live and you would go there and um, click on the specs system to submit your SIP. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. So you can contact me for any questions and if I can't answer them, I can get you in touch with the right person. Um, yeah, so and if there's any questions right now, you can also feel free to ask, or if you want me to go back a couple slides. First, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one question. On the monitoring for the community monitoring, in California, where I'm from, we're beginning to see some of the impacts of that where the community is monitoring and their monitors are giving them very different information than what the EPA monitors give, obviously, but also uh, different from what they understand. They, the misunderstanding between what a, a quality of sensors, what a uh, mm -hmm. cheap, cheaper sensor can yeah. monitor or measure, the accuracy, it's very confusing to the public. This affects small businesses significantly more, I think, than, than we at, at my agency anticipated yeah. because we are doing a lot to encourage uh, lower income and disadvantaged community, you know, folks to be more involved in the mm -hmm. environmental uh, situation around where they live and work. So. To your knowledge, is EPA or or is EPOS working 
with local communities or working with, with uh, maybe the EJ working group or someone to begin to address the question? Yeah, the, this team, the, I, when they started, they really wanted to create a sensor database that um, had information about all these, as many low cost sensors as they could get in there. Um, that would be open to the public, but um, they, OGC said that they couldn't do that because it would look as if they were endorsing sensors and, and there's no way they can ensure they got every single sensor. Um, so the kind of, the, they have created an internal, hundred sensors in it and it's a lot of the manufacturing information they're trying they would like it to be yelp for sensors basically so um, state agencies and, and epa would be adding to it as well and help to kind of inform like what's a good sensor what's not what what are people is people's experience with it um and there are the data um interpretation team that was working with advanced monitoring under enterprise they are t a lot of what they're doing is trying to create messaging and communication so that to educate groups on um, how to read different standards and why some sensors may not work as well as others and how to tr you know try to um, get a sensor that if you if you are doing citizen science you know how to get a sensor that would be helpful data um, and uh, and they can, without endorsing anything. And their, their solution to EPA not being able to collect all these sensors and kind of review the market and create a third party certification system. So they did do a market study and there is um, a, a desire and a need for that. Um, it would work a little bit like um, the uh, Energy Star. So, and they've, they've talked to the ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, about this, and they're kind of working through them because ANSI can, um, it's a way to talk to everybody and not exclude anyone, um, and uh, kind of work to, and part of the, the standards that they're gonna look at, um, you know, best practices for in June is kind of coming up with a way that like, this is what we think might be ideal. And then um, I know they, they did talk to the environmental, the EELC about funding for um, EPA to kind of set standards and then maybe a third party certification body, the manufacturer would go to that body, pay to have their sensor tested and then get an, a seal like the Energy Star seal. Um, and then so trying to make um, these low cost sensors a little easier to differentiate between and more accessible to not only state agencies and industry um, that are interested, but also the public too. And then we also, they're also taught, having conversations about how to, how to communicate it on the front end with some of these groups. Um, because in Maryland, they have a lot of citizens groups that have set up, set up sensors. And in some cases they say, you know, hey, that's great, but why don't you put one next to one of our federally verified sensors? And then if the, if the data is like way far apart, then we know it's not so great. But if it's um, close, then, then we have a better idea that like maybe that isn't so, such bad data um, and that kind of thing. So it's a tough conversation because I guess it's a little tricky and EPA doesn't want to endorse anything, but yeah, people are having it, so yeah. <clears throat> A somewhat similar question to Lauren's um, it, in terms of training. Uh, I'm wondering if there's also a plan for training with the new combined emissions reporting system, um, just having experience CEDRI um, as a, a consultant to try and fill that out for a company. If the training that was available a number of years ago was really not as helpful as it, as it could be, and uh, I've seen that improve. But hopefully they're planning from the beginning as they change the system to really beef up the training for anyone who's not familiar with it, especially on the small business side. Yeah. They don't have technical people. And, and for an engineer that I am trying to do CEDRI was just kind of crazy. <coughs> so hopefully, and, you know. Yeah, and I, I don't know that they've talked about that specifically in general. That, that is a theme that we see in enterprise, um, better training and better access to tools. <clears throat> and being able to even just locate it a little easier um and that's something I, I will bring up with them the actual uh, this actually moving over to a common emissions form is probably kind of far away but um it's on the horizon um but yeah that's something i'll i'll bring up to the team 
Um, and I know like the specs for SIPs with that new interface, they did do um, training modules that are available online and then they have them um, on the actual um, interface too, kind of on the front page. So trying to make that more, in general, across teams are trying to make it a little more available and obvious. So. Hi, um, was Slides one of the programs that the Enterprise worked on as a project at the team? And, and the second part of my question kind of, like, how long does it take when, it sounds really complex when you have um, e enterprise teams and project ideas, and maybe states yeah. involved, and then contractors that are going to be working. How long does it take for a project to, to begin and come to fruition and be uh, used? For instance, Slice, if you know that. Project. Yeah, Slice, I think, pre, I'm pretty sure it predates e enterprise. I, I'm not exactly sure, and maybe it used the Exchange Network. It predates me. Um, but yeah, I might ask that question myself. But um, they are looking at Slice and generally the free version to try um, with the care teams looking at that as a way. And so is the facility identification team as a way to like incorporate something that a lot of states are already using um, and maybe push updates out on that, that platform. Um, but timing can vary. Uh, like the, the combined air emissions reporting team, I think long goals are looking at five plus years. They have um, tried to bring it down into like digestible chunks. So the sprints that kind of um, streamline the SEC codes and one team, they've made it a lot easier to, I think, update and archive and um, find SECs. And then, um, <clears throat> so th those are six to nine month sprints. Then the, like the SIPs, um, specs for SIPs team, that was about a year um, where they were talking and were going back and forth with the contractor. Um, and then with the final product. So that, and that one I think kind of went, maybe that would be the fastest I know of is maybe about a year for like the full team product. Um, but then they also, they're starting to try to do um, kind of agile development now with the six to nine months runs. So, and they're also hoping with, by doing it on a smaller time frame that um, they can get more varied state participation too. And locals and tribes. <laughs> I think <laughs> um, how does the uh, e enterprise fit into um, EPA's current work on, on this? And how is it? Um, they mention, and in reference to shared governance and as a model for cooperative federalism, they, they mention a couple times in their strategic plan. And then they also um, talk about uh, the portal in their strategic plan as well. And as that being kind of a place where they're going to focus on maybe trying to get more um, information on the portal for states and industry. Um, and then is Henry Darwin, I think, is the COO yeah, of EPA. So, and I always forget if that's like number two or three or somewhere in one of those boxes up there. Um, but, and he's um, been a big proponent of um, <clears throat> lean for a long time. I don't know if anyone here is from Arizona and has all the, the lean Kaizen events. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but um, I think Arkansas DQ has, has done a lot of it and some of the other ones as well. Yeah. Um, but so he's, a, he's, and he was a big um, proponent of the enterprise before he left a, um, the Arizona DEQ, I think, um, he was the co-chair for the Combined Air Emissions Reporting Team. So um, I think there's a lot of people in the agency thinking about it and um, thinking about it strategically, and it's a way to kind of, it saves money for everybody, I think, in the end, EPA saves tribes when everybody's a product they're happy with, and they're also breaking down communication barriers between offices and agencies and states and within EPA itself so that they're leveraging um, services a little, you know, more rapidly. <clears throat> what are some ways that individuals outside the government can involve with the enterprise to figure out that we're fortunate in Oklahoma that we at least into the three people because we're outside the mm -hmm. other states, how for me as organizations are involved? 
there EPA has some of this information up on their website and, and like the the combined air emissions reporting team their phase one work is finished so you can actually see a lot of their reports on EPA's website um, I should have put the links on the slides but if you just google EPA the enterprise it, the first thing that comes up ECOS also ha or ECOS also runs a version of the website um, sometimes we can put documents up a little faster than EPA can so um, we uh, but they are pretty much the same and then um, for some of the teams there's public webinars to update people um, every couple months like the care team and, and oftentimes we have like 200 or so industry representatives on those calls and that's something if you just want to email me I can um, add you to the list or point you to the the lister um, uh, and then there's an e-enterprise newsletter so and I guess the easiest thing to do would probably just to email me and I have some cards I can hand out um, and I can we can add you to the enterprise newsletter that goes out that would be keeping you up to date on open calls and projects that are going on and different workshops that you can participate in. So. Oh, thank you.